Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be back in Australia, at least uh, virtually. So I'm going to speak on um, some work that my co-authors and I have been doing to uh, understand correlations of arithmetic functions, um, and in particular to sort of emphasize a, an emerging philosophy where if you want to understand these correlations, you should approximate these functions by, by simpler models. Um, so we're going to, to talk about really just the most classical arithmetic functions, um, basically the ones connected to the Riemann zeta function. So um, the arithmetic functions that we will care about are the Mobius function, um, the function that equals minus one to the k when n is square free and the sum of k prime, product k primes. Um, the Louvre function, which is defined the same way, but you, you drop the uh, square free uh, restriction. Um, the Bomangold function, which is basically counting primes, it's defined to be log p when, p when n is a prime p or when n is the power of a prime p and otherwise it's zero. Um, and then you, we have the divisor function, dk, which is the number of ways you can write a number n as the, as the product of, of k factors. So these are very classical functions. Uh, they're all related to each other. Uh, and one way to see that is by looking at the Dirichlet series. And uh, there are uh, standard computations that show that all the Dirichlet series are various functions of the Riemann zeta function. So um, that is a big clue that they're all connected to each other. And there's many classical identities uh, relating these. So uh, we will be interested in um, understanding correlations of these functions. So you take these functions, uh, you shift them by various shifts, h1 up to hk, say, and then you, you, you average them uh, as n ranges over some range, say from 1 to x. Um, and there's various uh, questions about these correlations, um, most of which are still open. Um, so for example, uh, if you care about uh, correlations of the Mobius function or the um, Louvre function, there is a conjecture of Chowler that says that all these um, um, uh, correlations should be asymptotically um, zero. So that if you um, if you average from n from one to x, uh, the product of say mu of n plus one, mu of n plus two, mu of n plus three, the average should be um, a little over one as n goes to as x goes to infinity. Okay, so there, there should not be any uh, strong correlation between sh shifts of the Mobius function, and similarly for the Louvre function. In fact, Mobius and Louvre are pretty much uh, they're almost identical uh, in that every result that we have from Mobius has a, a counterpart for Lugo. So I'm going to view these as some almost interchangeable objects. So uh, this is the Chala conjecture. Um, um, it's basically saying that the Mobius function and, and Lugo function behave like random sequences of plus minus ones or plus minus ones and zeros in the case of Mobius. Um, it's still open. Uh, when k is one, uh, it's equivalent to the prime number theorem. So we can prove it when k equals one. Um, but for k2 and higher, it's still not known. Um, the best we can do is that um, for some k, we can prove an averaged version. If you weight the uh, correlation by, by 1 over n, then the trivial bound here is big O log x. But uh, it is known that you get some cancellation once you uh, apply this sort of logarithmic um, averaging, uh, at least for k equals 2 and also for odd k. This is something that, that I k equals 2 I did about five years ago, uh, connected to this uh, urge discrepancy problem that Alex mentioned. Uh, and then later, we also, uh, with Johnny uh, Teravainen, we also um, were able to handle the case of odd k. But four and six and so forth are still open. OK, so that's one example of an open conjecture in the subject uh, for the Mobius and um, Lua functions. For the Vomangold function, the analogous conjecture is older. It's the hardy little prime tuples conjecture, that if you take the Vomangold function, uh, and you compute the k-point correlation. So you, you, you shift it k times, and you multiply them together, and you average. Um, the correlation should converge to a, a certain constant, um, which is normally called um, um, factor s. It's got the singular series, and it's some explicit expression, which uh, depends on the values of h1 and hk. Um, it's a product over primes of various local things. Um, I'll give you an example in just the next page. Um, Again, when k is one, uh, this is uh, basically just the prime number theorem. In that case, the singular series is just, just one. Um, but for higher k, it is open. So even for k equals two, um, and um, you know, it, it's expected to be quite hard because even k equals two is strong enough to prove the, tw the twin prime conjecture, which of course is famously open. Okay, so for instance, uh, if you just want to consider this two-point correlation, uh, or mangled of n, or mangled of n plus two. Um, that average should converge to this particular number, 1.32 something. Um, and it's this specific product of a primes. Uh, this is called the twin prime constant sometimes. Okay, 
Um, so that is the Hardy-Lindbergh conjecture, which is also open. Um, and finally, uh, the divisor functions, they are, they are also uh, conjectures about correlations to divisor functions. And again, if you're just taking a single function, um, it's, been, it's classical how to sum um, the correlations of, of, of a single divisor function. But even once you look at pair correlations, uh, the, uh, the expectation is that um, um, the conjecture is, is there any pair correlation like this, where you take the kth divisor function and then a shift, uh, you, uh, you pair it against the shift of an elf divisor function. You should, uh, this sum should be x times a certain polynomial in log x, uh, plus a lower order term, which, which has some power saving. Uh, and this is uh, an, an explicit polynomial. It depends on k, l, and h, but in a very complicated way. Um, OK, so um, all right. So, so this, uh, this conjecture is known to be true when one of the k and l is equal to 2. Um, and there's been uh, various work on improving this constant and so forth. Uh, but uh, when k and uh, but say when k and l are three, um, nothing is known. I mean, there's there's upper and lower bounds, but but no asymptotic is known at all. Okay, and so just just to give you a sense of how complicated these polynomials are, even when k and l are both two, um, the uh, formula is quite complicated. Yeah, so this correlation is actually equal to uh, this. Uh, polynomial, there's an x missing, uh, well, uh, there should be an, an, an x here actually. All right, so there's a certain polynomial, uh, but the coefficients are, depend on this shift h in quite a complicated way. So I, I, I wrote down the formulas for the leading coefficient and then the second coefficient, and the formula for a2 is even so complicated that I didn't even bother writing it down here because it wouldn't fit uh, on, on this page. Um, okay, and the, and the error term is uh, at least x to 1 12th better than the main term. That was shown by Estimate in, in the 1930s, uh, got improved a little bit later to 5 6 uh, in the 70s. Okay, so in all these examples, um, so, so what happens is that conjecturally, at least these conjecture, these correlations should have a main term, uh, which, um, which is some constant times x or some polynomial times x, uh, plus an error term, which is lower order. Um, but the, the main term can be quite complicated. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not even obvious, you know, we, we, going back to, to this example here, like this formula is not something you would easily predict. Um, I mean, maybe you might be able to predict the, the leading term uh, with some sort of uh, probabilistic heuristic or something, but, but the, the, these, these coefficients are not sort of obvious natural coefficients to emerge. Um, so one question is where did, where did these, these main terms come from and how would you even try to prove these, these, uh, these correlation type estimates? Okay. Um, so, uh, at least heuristically, uh, let's see, all right, um, heuristically, uh, for the Mobius function, at least, there is, uh, sort of a straightforward prediction, which is that the main term should always be zero. Um, or in other words, uh, or, uh, or at least in any correlation, which is not obviously not the case. So, um, this is general principle called the Mobius pseudorandomness principle that says that if you're correlating Mobius of n with any other function f of n, um, and f is not just um, is not clearly related to Mobius event, like it's, it's not just another copy of Mobius event. Then, if, if f has no obvious relationship with the Mobius function, then there should be correlation. Uh, so there should be no correlation between these two functions, and um, this sum should be smaller than what you would get if you just put absolute values everywhere. There should be some cancellation. Okay, so for instance, if you are correlating the Mobius function of n with the Mobius function n plus one. Um, there's no reason, so the Mobius function of n counts the parity of the number of prime factors of n, whether n is divisible by an even or odd number of prime factors. But there's no obvious relationship between the parity of the prime factorization of n and the parity of the prime factorization of plus one. So you would expect um, some cancellation here, uh, the Shufi bound is x, so you'd expect here that this sum should be, should be little of x. And that's just one case of, of the Charla conjecture. Um, yeah, so, um, and in fact, maybe the most famous uh, formal version of this principle is what's called the Sanek conjecture. That says that uh, whenever you have a, a deterministic sequence, which is a sequence that takes only finitely many values, but uh, for any k, the total number of values of k consecutive, um, so, so every sort of length k subword of this function, um, there, are, there are only sub exponentially, sub -exponentially many subwords. So that the total number of uh, possible strings of length k inside this, this sequence grows slower than any exponential function of k. Uh, such a function is called, called a deterministic sequence. For example, a periodic sequence would be term, deterministic, but that's certainly not, not the only case. Um, but then the, uh, the conjecture is that you get some cancellation there. Um, 
it turns out that this conjecture, I mean, it's still open. There's been many, many special cases been verified. Um, it turns out to essentially be equivalent to the Charlie conjecture. But I won't explain why here. Um, and there's also a very parallel Lubel uh, pseudo randomness principle. In fact, pretty much everything that we believe to be true for Mobius, we also believe to be true for, for, for Lubel. Okay, so that's sort of the main heuristic in the case of Mobius or Lubel. Um, one way to um, write this sort of um, heuristic um, is, uh, um, so basically what we're saying is that for the purposes of correlation, um, Mobius and Lubel behave like a zero function, that the correlation of Mobius with various functions behaves like the correlation of zero with those functions. Um, <coughs> sorry. So um, I'm using x approximate, approximate y to mean that x can be replaced by y whenever you want to compute certain, uh, compute various correlations, uh, correlating um, x with other things. Um, it's, it's a very um, vague statement. It, it's like saying x and y are close in some, in some weak topology or in some weak norm. Um, so of course, um, it, um, you have to take this approximation kind of uh, um, not too seriously. Like it, it, this, um, these functions are not close in the uniform topology. For example, that the, the L affinity distance between the Mobius function and zero is one. Okay, so in the sup norm, uh, these are far apart. But in certain correlation um, measuring norms, uh, these functions are close. Um, nowadays, the way we measure closeness actually is, is through things called the Gower's uniformity norms, which I will talk about later. All right, um, so that's what's going on for the Mobius function or the Lua function, um, that we, we believe that these functions are approximately zero. Now, von Mangold, uh, we don't believe is approximately zero because it has, uh, it's positive. Um, it has mean, and in fact, it's meaning close to one rather than zero. Um, and that's the content of the famous prime number theorem. The prime number theorem says that the average value of the Mobius function, of the von Mangold function is basically one, asymptotically one. So uh, just based on this, you might naively think, okay, I should uh, maybe the right approximation is that the Bomangold function is equal to one on the average. Um, and in fact, I mean that that one of the first random models of the primes was um, uh, created this way. So um, uh, what we now call the Kramer random model uh, says that okay, we're going to uh, if you want to predict what happens for the primes, like if you study things like gaps between primes, you will approximate uh, the Bomangold function by a random function. Whose, um, whose average is one. Um, so I think uh, what Kramer did was that uh, every number n has a one in, uh, with probability one of a log n is equal to uh, this, uh, you, you model lambda by log n, and then um, otherwise you model it by zero. Okay, but, uh, but on average you approximate by one. Okay, so um, this is sort of the Kramer model of the primes. Um, and uh, yeah, in particular, for the purpose of correlations, uh, this would predict that every correlation of the Vomango function should have uh, average one. Okay, but um, this is not, um, uh, this is too naive um, of an approximation because um, the Vomango function is very irregularly distributed in small moduli. For example, most primes are odd. Uh, and so what the Vomango function is mostly concentrated on odd numbers and not on even numbers. Whereas the constant function one is equally distributed on even and odd numbers. So, so this is not um, an accurate approximation um, to capture local uh, irregularities. Um, so, um, and you can see that more generally, um, if you compute the um, von Mangold function over in an ethnic progression, n equals a mod q, um, asymptotically, um, if you had the function one here, you would asymptotically get x over q, but you don't get that. You get x over um, phi of q, the Euler function of, of, of q. Um, when a and q are co-prime, and when a and q are not co-prime, you get zero as the mean term. So um, the, this approximation, approximating lambda by one, gives you the wrong prediction for the prime number theorem in ethnic progressions. And it also gives you the, the wrong prediction for things like the twin prime conjecture or correlations like this. Uh, but you can fix that. You can just replace, uh, you can use a more refined um, approximation. So for example, um, what you can do is that you can take um, the first few primes. So you pick some threshold w, lowercase w, and you take all the primes, you multiply all the primes up to lowercase w, call that big W. Um, and you define sort of uh, what I call the Kramer Granville approximation, uh, where instead of the function one, you take function one restricted. So you 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 um, you take advantage of the fact that you, you model the fact that primes are usually co-prime to w by restricting only to the numbers that are co-prime to w. But to compensate for that, you have to multiply, you have to divide out by the density of, of the set that you restricted to, or in other words, you multiply by the factor w over the order function of w. 
Um, and so this is an approximation. Now, what W do you choose? Um, uh, basically, uh, basically, anything that grows with x slowly enough will work. Uh, so for example, uh, one popular choice is to take a small power of log x, like log x to the one tenth. Um, and so this is um, an approximation. It's, it's a much uh, easier function to work with than the Moyang function. It's periodic, for example, a period w. Um, so its correlations are quite easy to work out. Um, so for example, it's, it's quite uh, easy to work out that this function obeys the same it obeys the right prime number theorem in ethnic questions and has the same sort of asymptotic as the um, as for mango to sell. So in, in that sense, at least, uh, this approximation is a good approximation to um, the Mangold function. All right, uh, at least if you look at moduli up to this, uh, this, this little w. Okay, um, and so this already can give you, this can already, for example, predict the highly little uh, conjecture. So um, the prime tuples conjecture, which is still open, says that the, uh, the k-point correlation of a formal function should equal a certain specific singular series plus a lower term. And it's not hard to compute that if you replace, um, if you just non-rigorously replace the, each uh, instance of the formal function by one of these um, approximations, you do get the, um, um, you can calculate the left-hand side and it is this singular series plus a lower term. So that's, that gives you support for this conjecture, but it is not a proof because we can't justify the replacement of each of these um, functions by, by these models. Now, um, this turns out these Kramer models are not the only models that we use to um, try to, to um, study the Wormwood function. There are other uh, models that are out there. Um, so if you, for example, one popular way to attack, um, to understand correlations and things like correlations of, is to use the circle method, um, or in other words, Fourier expansion. Um, now, if you Fourier expand the, um, Kramer model. So the Kramer model is periodic with period capital W. So you can, you can decompose it in terms of various plane waves. There's a finite combination of plane waves and there's a certain Fourier expansion um, in, where you have a, a Fourier coefficient at every rational A of a Q for every Q dividing this big W and the coefficients depend on these things called Ramanujan sums. Okay, so there's a very explicit um, um, expansion here, but uh, the uh, these denominators can get, get quite large. Capital, capital W is the product of all primes up to, up to little w, which is like exponentially large in little w. And so you can get quite um, large denominators here, which is not always desirable. So sometimes it is useful to truncate this Fourier expansion. So you, you, you uh, in, instead of summing the series over all uh, denominators dividing this big w, you take the same series, but you only sum it over all Qs up to some threshold. So you, you, you pick some threshold capital Q and you only take what I call the major arc um, frequencies here. So you, you only look at um, frequencies A over little Q where Q, little Q uh, only ranges up to this, this threshold uh, big Q. Um, and uh, here big Q, there's lots of choices, but again, um, a good choice is, is some power of X, like X to the one tenth. Um, and this, this turns out to be an approximation that one can compute with, like, like various correlations for, um, for, for this function can also be computed with quite high accuracy. Um, and roughly speaking, the way the circle method works is it, it, there's various ways to rigorously re replace the Romango function by this major approximation in certain cases. So for example, if you want to prove um, the famous three primes theorem of Vinogradov, that every large odd number is the sum of three primes, you can um, use a circle method to um, to express the, the count of three primes as, as some Fourier expression involving uh, the von Mangold function, but then you can replace the von Mangold function by this major arc approximation, and it turns out the error term is, is, is actually not too bad, uh, and then you just compute what the major arc contribution is, and that's roughly speaking how you actually prove this uh, Vinogradov theorem. Okay, um, another approximation that is popular um, comes from this identity. So I, I told you that uh, the von Mangold function, the Mobius function, all these functions are related to each other. Um, here's one such identity. It turns out that the um, um, von Mangold function is actually a divisor sum, summing over all divisors of n, a certain uh, weight, and the weight depends on the Mobius function. So this is a, a elementary identity. Um, and uh, one way that you can but but this this sum is it gets quite complicated uh, because the terms when d is large are not very well understood. Uh, but the terms when d is small, the contribution of d is small, are um, not so bad. So you can um, you can try to approximate this. So uh, so one approximation is, is just a, a, a truncation. You truncate d up to some threshold r, um, and again a, a typical choice is some small power of x like x to the one tenth again. 
is, is a decent choice. Um, and so you can split the Wormangle function as what's called a lambda sharp, uh, which is the contribution of the small devices, and then lambda flat, which is everything else, the contribution of the large devices. Um, and lambda sharp is a fairly well understood type of sum. This, this is what we call a type one sum. Uh, whenever you sum over all devices dividing n of some weights, that type of sum is called a type one sum. And uh, the methods of sieve theory that you uh, control those sums quite well. So we, we understand lots of, of uh, um, questions. We can answer lots of questions about the, the type one part. And uh, the hard thing is to try to, 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 to get rid of, of this uh, lambda flat error. In, in principle, this guy is negligible, but proving that is often um, tricky. Uh, just a technical thing sometimes. Um, so, so here we just did a very rough uh, cutoff. You know, this, this cutoff log D goes up to log R and then it, 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 it drops down to zero. Um, it, it, for technical reasons, sometimes it's, it's better to make a smoother cutoff. That's called a, a golden yodelum type approximate. Uh, but that's just a technical detail. I think I will not uh, uh, dwell on that. Okay, so, so these are sort of three ways in which you can approximate the Momangle function. And they, they are useful in, in different um, contexts. Um, uh, the Kramer approximation, for example, uh, one nice thing, it, it's very combinatorial, it's, it's non-negative, um, it, it splits up into an Euler product, uh, so that's kind of nice. Um, it's a, it, it very clearly isolates um, each to the role of, of each small prime separately. Um, the major arc approximate, its main advantage is that it's got a very, very nice Fourier um, decomposition. So if you want to use the circle method, this is usually the approximate of choice. Um, and as I said, lambda sharp is a type one sum, and its correlations can be computed almost exactly where we understand those sums very, very well. Okay, um, so these are all expect, these approximates are all expected to be good approximates to the Bromengo function, but um, they, there's a limit, at least in our current state of knowledge to, to actually proving that. Um, and it, it's a standard problem in analytic number theory. Uh, it's, it's, the, the, it's the Siegel zero phenomenon um, that blocks um, these, these approximates from being too good um, of an approximation to lambda. So C equals zero, just to remind you, uh, is that if you take a Dirichlet character, chi, a quadratic character um, with some conductor Q, and if you have a zero on the real line, so you have a zero at some beta, where beta is really, really close to one, like, like closer than one of a log Q to one, uh, that's called a C equals zero. Um, and these C equals zeros, they distort the behavior of um, the Weimar function and also the Mobius and and um, and um, Luber functions, but they distort the behavior of such functions on progressions of length q. Um, so, in particular, for example, lambda sharp is supposed to be a good approximation of lambda. Um, and conjecturally, if you assume things like um, the generalized Riemann hypothesis, the error should be really good. You should you should you should be much much smaller than x. Like you should, should be like like square root of x. Um, but we can't prove that um, because of these sequel zeros. Um, the best we can do. The, the, the best uh, error term we can make between von Mangold and this von Mangold sharp is uh, we, can, we can only improve the, um, uh, the trivial bound of x by a power of log x. Uh, you can have any power you like, but you lose a constant depending on, on your exponent. Uh, and what's worse is that this constant turns out to be ineffective. There is actually no um, uh, explicit um, effective uh, bound for this constant. It, it depends on whether a sequel zero exists and where it is, and we don't have good bounds for that. Um, so that's the famous siegel wolfowitz theorem. Um, and I said this for lambda sharp, but, but for the other two, two approximates, you have a similar problem. Uh, and this is not very good because um, often you want much better accuracy. You, you don't just want to save um, logs, you want to save a much better power, than, than a much better saving than, 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 uh, um, than log x. OK, but there is a standard fix to that. Um, so um, if sequel zeros exist, now we don't believe they exist. Um, the, the, we believe in the generalized Riemann hypothesis, which implies in particular that no sequel zeros exist. Um, but we can't prove that. It's very, very frustrating. After 50, 60 years, we, we have not been able to exclude the possibility of a sequel zero, um, but we've learned to live with them. Um, so maybe they exist, um, but, uh, and if they exist, um, what we can do is that we can we can just update our approximations to take uh, we add an extra term that um, accommodates those um, uh, that, that that that's equal zero and suddenly your approximations get a lot better once you add that term. So, for example, we have this Kramer random model um, where we just we just sort of naively uh, restrict n to the numbers co-prime to this big W and you 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 give equal weight to every residue class. But if there is a sequel zero, uh, what you should do is that you should um, add uh, an, an extra term. So you don't just multiply by one, 
but you add another term which is sensitive to this exceptional character and also to this exceptional zero. Um, and uh, so you can define what we call the Siegel approximate, which is just uh, a corrected version of the Kramer approximate. Um, and, um, and so this, this, this is uh, the Siegel approximation. Um, here we, we're using a classical theorem of Van Dorn Page that says that, that, that for any fixed special Q, there's at most one Siegel zero. So if Siegel zeros exist, they're basically unique. Um, now, the, the purpose of introducing this more complicated um, approximation is that you have a much better um, error term. So it turns out um, that, the, that if you want to approximate uh, the von Mangold function by the Siegel approximation in any ethnic progression, the error is now, you, you don't just save powers of log x, you actually save um, almost uh, exponentially more saving. You get exponential of minus a small power of log x. Um, so this is almost as good as saving a power of x. So if this constant c was one, uh, you would actually save some power of x. Um, this constant c in practice is more like one half or one third. Um, so it's, it's not as good as saving a power of x, but it's pretty close. Um, it's what I call pseudo polynomial savings. It's much, much better than logarithmic savings. Um, yeah, so you can approximate on ethnic regressions and you can, you can do, um, you know, for a bit more work, you can, you can also show that lambda Siegel is a good approximation of lambda in other ways as well. Like if you want to look at Fourier coefficients, if you want to test this, uh, the error between these two functions, um, all their Fourier coefficients turn out to be similarly small. You also get a pseudo polynomial saving. Um, uh, the way you prove this is the standards of Vinogradov technique. If theta is major arc, if it's a over Q, close to a over Q, you use um, Siegel's theorem. Uh, if, but if, if you're minor arc, you have to use uh, the method of bilinear sums. Um, you factor this whole thing as a Dirichlet convolution, and you do lots and lots of Cauchy Schwartz. Okay. Um, now, recently we were able to prove something even stronger than this. Um, so uh, earlier this year, uh, Joni Tervainen and I. Uh, we put a theorem which looks really complicated, but there's a reason why we did this. So um, we replaced this, this linear phase here by a more general object, which is called a null sequence. So um, this E of theta of n, you're taking a linear function of n, uh, which maps into the unit circle. And then you, you're taking a function, this function E is like, it's just a nice smooth map from the circle to the complex numbers. Um, more generally, um, you, can, you can replace a circle by a more general object called a null manifold. You take a null point Lie group, and you divide it by a lattice. Um, so you can think of a torus uh, or like um, something called a Heisenberg null manifold, which is like a circle bundle over a two torus. Um, but you can take any null manifold. You can take, instead of a linear function, you can take any polynomial map into that null manifold, G of n. And then instead of the smooth function E, you take any uh, Lipschitz function. Um, and there's certain uh, hypotheses on, on uh, the dimension of the manifold and, and, the, and the, uh, how, how Lipschitz the function is and so forth. But, um, but for any such choice of null sequence, you also get this exponential bound. Now, this is a complicated statement, but uh, perhaps uh, an easy case to keep in mind is that if, if you just replace this linear phase by some polynomial, like you take e to the theta n squared, for example, um, that you also get uh, um, good bounds on, um, uh, on all. So lambda and lambda Siegel are very close approximations, um, no matter what kind of polynomial phase, uh, you you uh, you correlate against, and you have a uniform bound over all um, polynomials. Okay, now uh, why did we bother? Prove, and the, the way you prove this is, is a sort of more complicated version of um, this uh, circle method, uh, um, this method of bilinear sums uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, now, why do we bother proving this theorem? Um, it's because these no sequences. Um, there's a deep fact in arithmetic combinatorics is that they are what control. Um, lots of, so lots and lots of correlations are controlled by, by, um, by these no sequences. Uh, so I need to quickly review um, the, the theory of Gower's uniformity norms. Now, uh, in this, uh, this is uh, leaving number theory a little bit. Um, and for those who haven't seen this stuff before, this will maybe not make too much sense. But, so, um, but it turns out that um, given any function, if you have a, a sequence of functions defined on the integers, uh, there's a way to sort of measure how random it is, uh, like how much cancellation there is present in the sequence. Um, and it's uh, um, um, the way you measure them is by these things called these Gauss uniformity norms. So for every degree d, you can define the d um, Gauss uniformity norm. And it's, it's defined in a moderately complicated way. You, um, you take all d-dimensional parallel pipe bits in the integers and you, you multiply the values of f on the values at the, at the corners of this parallel pipe bit 
uh, you also um, apply an alternating complex conjugation. Uh, and you sum all that up, uh, and then you take a 2D root, and that turns out to be a norm, and that's called the Gauss norm. Um, that's how you define the integers. On any sub interval of the integers, there's a normalized norm that you can define. Um, yeah, so the, the definition is technical. Um, roughly speaking, uh, what this norm does is that it measures the extent to which your function looks like a phase polynomial, um, the exponential of a polynomial of degree d minus one. Um, you see, this whole operation is a little bit like taking the dth derivative of a phase. And a polynomial of degree d minus one has the property that if you differentiate d times, uh, you get zero. And that, that precisely defines a polynomial of degree d minus one. So yeah, if f looks like um, a phase polynomial like this, then this Gauss norm is going to be large. And if f doesn't look at all like a phase polynomial, then this Gauss norm should be small. So it's, it's, it's measuring sort of polynomial, polynomial structure present in f. Um, and uh, there is uh, um, um, quite a deep theorem. Um, oh, why this is, it was, it's not 2021, it was proven, but uh, it came out, sorry, 20, 20, 2012 is, is, the, uh, is, is when we did this. Um, but uh, it turns out that if you want to know when, this, uh, when a Gauss norm is small or not, it turns out that a Gauss norm is small if and only if um, it doesn't correlate with any one of these null sequences. So if, if you want to prove that a certain Gauss norm is small, then, um, then uh, you have to, basically you have to show that, that it doesn't correlate with any of these new sequences. And this is an epinonia. Um, in the case of one dimensional, um, in, in, for degree one, uh, this, this Gauss norm can be written in terms of the Fourier transform, and this is an easy application of the circle method. Uh, but for, for higher D, this is, this is much harder. Um, Okay, um, the first few proofs of this theorem were qualitative, um, so I, I didn't tell you what small went. Um, um, and, and initially, the first few proofs of this theorem did not actually give a good dependence. Um, yeah, so, so there are some quantifiers here, like for every delta, there's an epsilon, such that this is less than delta, this is less than epsilon, and so forth. Um, only very recently, in 2018, was there a quantitative version of this theorem that's, that's so that if you have a specific bound on how small these correlations are, you can get a specific bound on these Gauss norms. Um, the dependence is basically uh, double logarithmic. So if, if you have um, um, some gain here by some delta, um, the, the gain you get over on the Gauss norm is like one of a log log one of a delta. You, you gain a double logarithm of, of uh, whatever you, um, you had over here. So um, the reason why Johnny and I, we, we proved this correlation theorem is because if you plug it in to this theorem of manners, this inverse theorem, uh, you also get um, some smallness of the Gauss norms. That uh, that this Morgan function and this Siegel approximate are um, are close in um, these Gauss norms. That every Gauss norm uh, you measure them in the, the, the distance actually you you gain a, a a log log a power of log log x over the trivial bar. Um, so this was the first uh, quantitative bound uh, approximation of this type. Um, uh, there, there's a technical detail which maybe is not. Uh, just for the experts, um, this inverse theorem that I invoked here, it only works for bounded functions. And there's an annoying problem that von Mangold is not bounded, um, but there's a standard trick to deal with that called densification, which, but I will skip that. Okay, so um, Lambda is close to the Siegel approximation in the um, Gauss norms. Um, it turns out that also from standard sift theory computations, the Siegel norm is also close to the, um, the Kramer model. So, so also Lambda is close to the Kramer model um, in, in Gauss norms. And similarly for other um, approximations to um, Omengo. So previously, uh, there were results of this type, but they were completely qualitative. Uh, we, we knew that this, this norm went to zero, but in a completely ineffective way. We had no bound whatsoever on how this decay to zero. But, but now we have these log log x bounds. Now we have a quantitative bound. And these, these are even um, effective bounds. Um, they don't, uh, all the constants are in principle computable. And now, the reason we care about this is that this Gauss norm turns out to control lots of other things. Um, so um, by a very standard Cauchy-Schwarz argument, um, we can now uh, control correlations. We can control many, many correlations of the von Mangold function. So um, if you call it the von Mangold function, um, if you evaluate over k different linear forms in m variables, um, and as long as these forms are independent, are pairwise independent, um, so these are affine linear forms whose linear parts are, are pairwise independent. Um, we can prove the correct hardy littlewood type conjecture for these um, 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 for these correlations. There's, there's a singular series term, which uh, that's the main term, 
And the error we now know is, is um, log log x better than, than the main term. Um, previously, there was, an, um, so Ben Green and I, uh, 10 years ago, we proved a similar statement, but with a qualitative term, little of one, but completely ineffective. Uh, but now the bounds are, are very quantitative and very effective. I mean, still not great. Uh, you know, conjecturally, uh, the bounds should actually be more like um, power gain index. So we're, we're two logs away from, from the truth, but still this is a lot better than, than what was known before. Um, so for example, um, this theorem um, generalizes uh, the other theorem that Alex mentioned that, that, that the primes contain average long ethnic progressions, uh, but it even tells you how many ethnic progressions there are up to X, of length K up to some large X, gives an asymptotic and a quantitative bound on the error term, which was not known before. Okay. Um, so that's the story for the Vermengold function. Now what happens for um, the Lubo function? Um, and the um, Mobius function, uh, I realize I'm running a bit short on time here. Um, okay, um, so maybe I'll just say that there are analogs um, for, so there's, there's also a Siegel model for, for Mangold and, and Mobius. Um, they are a little bit complicated. So um, uh, for example, Lambda is a completely multiplicative function. Um, the way you take a Siegel modification is that um, for small primes, you don't change anything at all. You, you keep the Lua function at minus one, but for large primes, you replace um, minus one by this uh, exceptional character, and then you make it completely multiplicative, and then you, you, you complete the, the, the function. Uh, and that's how you define this approximation. Um, but um, maybe I'll skip the details and just say that you can get um, similar approximations here. Okay. Um, now, one use of these approximations, which is uh, kind of cute, um, is that um, these conjectures, these highly Littlewood and Charlie conjectures that we can't prove in general, um, so uh, there's a weird fact that, uh, that when you have a Siegel zero, uh, sometimes number theory gets easier. Um, so there's certain theorems that we can prove with a Siegel zero that we can't prove even on the Riemann hypothesis or GRH. Um, so for example, many, many years ago, uh, Heath Brown showed that if you have a Siegel zero, um, then for a certain range of X, uh, you, uh, you can prove at least the twin prime case of the um, hardy little prime two conjecture that in fact, you have the right asymptotic for um, the correlation of twin primes. And, and you, you gain a certain factor depending on how good your sequence zero is. Um, in particular, if you had an infinite sequence of sequence zeros, uh, this would imply that the, the trim kind of conjecture is true. So that's one of the few cases where we can actually prove the trim kind of conjecture. Um, and he basically used um, a Siegel approximate to, to Lambda. Um, more recently, um, Germain and Katai proved a similar statement for the Charlie conjecture that again, if there's a sequence zero, uh, you can start proving cases of the Charlie conjecture. Uh, and then more recently, in fact, this year, um, the, the general Charlie conjecture was also shown to be provable if you have a sequel zero. Um, and then by, by using these, these approximates, um, Yoni and I were able to unify uh, those previous results. Um, and we were able to show that if you have a sequel zero, then um, you can also control mixed correlations, right? that if you, can, if you, you can correlate some number of copies of the Romagot function, and some number of copies of the Lua function, and you get the expected uh, singular series plus uh, a lower order term. Um, there's one catch though, uh, we are only able to handle, uh, you, uh, as long as you only have at most two copies of, of the Vormangold function. You can have as many copies of Lua as you want, but our understanding of Vormangold unfortunately is limited to, um, to two. Um, uh, the reason is because we approximate the Vormangold function by a function that looks like the divisor function D2. And for D2, uh, our current understanding is that we understand pair correlations, but not three point or higher correlations. So this is basically the limit of the method. Okay. Um, I think I'll skip um, some of the discussion about that. Um, so the um, last thing I wanna say is that we, we also have, uh, have developed good approximations loops for uh, the divisor function. Um, now, um, it's not actually obvious how to approximate the divisor function correctly. Um, you, see, you see, the divisor function has quite a complicated distribution. If, if, you, if you sum it in any ethnic progression, um, you will get um, x times a certain polynomial in log x plus an error term. But the polynomial depends in a very complicated way on k and on a on q. Um, and you get all kinds of weird lower terms. You know, for example, even if you just solve the um, sum d2 up to x, uh, you get x log x, which is kind of expected, but you get this weird lower order term, two gamma minus one, where gamma is the, uh, the Euler constant. 
Um, and if you sum on a progression, you get all kinds of correction terms as well. Um, and so if you want to understand what the device function does, uh, you want to create approximants for it, um, which have the same distribution in ethnic progressions as DK. Um, and this turns out to actually be quite non-trivial. Um, you can do it by um, a, um, a rather complicated method called the delta method of Duke, Friedman, and Ivanich, um, or you can use the circle method, uh, but you get very complicated formulas for DK, which are not easy to work with. Um, so we found recently a combinatorial uh, approximation, which gives, uh, which is, which seems to give all the right predictions. So, so we, we can find an approximate that at least heuristically lets us uh, predict all, uh, all the correlations for DK that, that, that we believe to be true. Um, maybe I'll skip this slide. Uh, so maybe I'll just explain um, um, very briefly how this correlation comes about. Um, so I just illustrated for the, the classical divisor function where you are um, summing, yeah, so maybe here actually uh, uh, some uh, drawing would be appropriate. So, so the divisor function is, is summing um, all the divisors of number n. So one way you can think about this is that you're taking the hyperbola, uh, let's say uh, m times l equals n, and you're counting lattice points on this hyperbola. Okay, that's the divisor function. Now you can split up this function um, into static pieces. So for, um, for any range t, I, I can just look at the divisors between t and e times t and just count divisors in this little block. Okay, and that's what I call d2 sub t. Uh, and then I slide this block around and it turns out that if I, if I average, um, if I average uh, all these blocks together, I recover my original function. Uh, that's basically because some t and et, uh, ds over s is always equal to one. Okay, so I can decompose my hyperbola into little didactic chunks. So I can decompose my divisor function into little pieces like this. Okay, now what's the purpose of doing that? Um, okay, so, um, so this t ranges, um, this t parameter ranges anywhere between one and n. Um, now, if t is very small, okay, if t is small, uh, this type of sum is actually quite well understood. This is what we call a type one sum because we are now, uh, we're only testing divisibility using numbers M that are quite small. Um, and so uh, this portion of the device function, we understand very well. Uh, all the questions, all the correlations of this piece of DT, um, these pieces of DT are well understood. Um, now also uh, when T is very large, let's say bigger than one minus epsilon, um, the, um, this sum is also really well understood because there's a symmetry. You can make a change of variables. You can flip m to n over m. And so this divisor function is basically a, D, uh, a d2t is actually the same as d2n over t, again, over et, uh, the way I've normalized things. Um, but um, but uh, this part is also a type one sum. So it's it's only the the, uh, the intermediate ranges of t that, um, that cause a lot of trouble for which we don't understand the correlations. But it turns out that a, a good choice for approximation um, is just, uh, you take all the t's here and you, you just sort of uh, replace them. You, you, you pick a, a t on, on the edge, uh, like, like into the epsilon. And you just, if you just by brute force replace all the dt's um, in the intermediate range by, by just um, 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 uh, one of the, the extreme uh, choice of t uh, in this range, uh, that turns out to be quite a good approximation. So. Um, dt is the epoxy is the average of a uh, d2t for all the t's. You just keep the the, uh, the con contributions of, of the um, very small and very large t's, and for everybody else, you just use uh, let's say um, um, this uh, d2. And so this is a moderately complicated approximation, but it turns out to be very accurate. Um, so what we were able to show. Uh, so this is work with Kaiser Matabaki, uh, Zhuangcheng Xiao, and Juni uh, Tervainen. That um, uh, so there's, there's a similar approximation you can you can make. Oops, um, similar approximation you can make for any DK, and the um, the error is actually well behaved with respect to any no sequence, uh, and in fact you get a power saving of the trivial bound, um, and not just for large intervals but even for short intervals. We can actually um, control correlations between x and x plus h where uh, h is a uh, power of x. Um, the specific power depends on k. Um, like for d2, um, you can get x to one third, uh, but for higher k, you need larger, um, larger constants. 
but uh, we, we can actually show that DK is well approximated by this tractable approximation um, in short intervals. And um, as a consequence, um, by the same sort of technologies before, we can control Gauss norms, and then you can control other correlations. So for instance, um, uh, let's see, did I? Uh, yeah, so for example, if you want to uh, control arithmetic progressions uh, weighted by divisor functions, uh, we now have um, good asymptotics for, for these sort of sums. Um, I think uh, I'm out of time. So I will just say one thing about, um, uh, okay, so there's this, uh, um, the proof uses um, all kinds of things. There's a, there's a large sieve for, for neural sequences and uh, lots of uh, combinatorial decompositions, but um, perhaps one cute thing which uh, I'm, um, uh, want to mention is uh, th there's one very elementary decomposition that shows up in this argument. Um, and it already shows up like if you wanted to understand just a divisor sum, okay, so forget all this other stuff. If you wanted to, to control a sum like this, um, then uh, what this expression is, you can, you can think of this geometrically. This is just counting lattice points. If, if you take two um, hyperbolae, nm equals x and nm equals x plus h, Okay, and you have this, this region. Um, this sum here, counting the divisor function be, um, between x and x plus h, that's just counting all the lattice points in a region between two hyperbola. Um, and if you wanted to have a more complicated sum, if you also wanted to, to say, for example, put a, um, a, a weight here, you would, you would sum over these lattice points, some more complicated, I think you sum alpha and m. Um, over uh, the set, and that was, that's how you would you would sum this expression. Okay, so this is a moderately uh, complicated looking expression. So when we tried when we first tried to control these sums, we tried all kinds of kind of short tricks like like uh, vowel differencing, van der Kolbe kind of thing. We also tried uh, automorphic methods, uh, the, the Voronoi formula, and things like that, um, and they kind of worked. But um, the most effective thing we, we found was actually a very elementary decomposition, which is actually um, Reminded us of the classical Hardy Lillard method. So, classically, Hardy Lillard decomposed the circle into um, major and minor arcs using fairy sequences. Um, and by using those kind of elementary uh, uh, decompositions, it turns out that there's a way to split up the set into um, arithmetic progressions that, that you can partition the set using geometry of numbers into arithmetic progressions. And you can, you can split up the sum into sums over arithmetic regressions, which we, we do understand pretty well, um, at least if H is big enough, uh, H has to be at least uh, X to the one third. Um, and then um, we have some a, a very nice elementary decomposition. And this is the key to making um, all the D2 sums work out. And then once you have D2, you can kind of iterate and you can start controlling D3 and D4 and so forth. Um, so that was one nice uh, little uh, thing that came out. Thank you very much. Can we have uh, some time for questions? Hi, Terry. Thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, I have a question about this the Mobius um, pseudo randomness. Mm -hmm. So if I take something like, um, suppose you take one of the, the non trivial zeros of the of the Riemann zeta function on the critical line, okay. and you take a function like something, I'm not sure exactly what I want, but something like n to the it where I where t is the, the imaginary mm -hmm. part So something that has the, mm -hmm. the right oscillatory behavior. Does a function like that correlate with them? Um, with the Mobius function, because it, uh, it feels like it feels like it should, but it also feels like it's not directly related to the prime decomposition. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. So it so it does. It, uh, yeah. So if you had a zero like this of the zeta function, um, it would resonate, uh, but it resonates very weakly. Um, it, uh, it would expect it to resonate like uh, like x to the one half, okay, because of the one half here, um, which is a lot less than x. Okay. Um, so, so there is a certain res uh, resonance, um, but um, but compared to the trivial bound of X, um, the resonance gets weaker and weaker because the zero is is inside the critical strip. Now, um, if if there was a zero um, of the zeta function on the right of the critical strip at one plus it, um, then um, okay, th um, then um, there would be a correlation. Um, and that would be very unexpected. Okay, that, and and the, yeah, so so, so that, that would be a violation of the a strong violation of the Mobius pseudo randomness principle. Now, of course, uh, we know that there are no zeros on um, over here, and so um, if you like, the the, the Mobius pseudo randomness principle is incorporating um, um, the prime number theorem as as part of its uh, 
um, statement. Um, in fact, the Pranamo theorem is uh, one, one way to, to phrase the Pranamo theorem is just the statement that that, uh, that, uh, that the sum is, is little of x. Yeah, so, so all the zeros of this data function, they do create some correlation, but um, um, but in the asymptotic limits that we're considering, uh, they're all negligible because they're, they're always in, inside the strip rather than on the boundary. Um, yeah, the closer they will, they, they are okay. to, the, to the boundary, the, 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 the stronger the correlation. But the, there's this. But, right, thank you. Hi, Terry. Many thanks for your talk. There you go. Uh, could we quickly come back to the slide where you have this conditional result on the assumption of the Ziegler zero? All right. The last in the series. You presented several, but the last one. Uh, yes. Uh, how do you know that the range is not void? Um, okay. Yeah. So um, yeah. Um, part of the definition of a sequel zero. Yeah. So sequel zero is a zero where the uh, the distance to one is one of a log cube times some eta, and and you assume eta to be large, larger than some absolute constant. Say. Okay. So you need. Yeah. Okay. So you need to be very very close. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This K is, is uh, just some fixed constant. So Q to a fixed, a fixed constant and, and here mm -hmm. Q to something to be on the eta. Yeah, so yeah, eta needs to be large. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. And so if you have uh, time, just another mm -hmm. kind of general equation. Mm -hmm. When you consider logarithmic Chola, right? Mm -hmm. And the approximation to the proper Chola conjecture. Mm -hmm. What if you replace N in the denominator with something slightly, slightly light, smaller than N, than N over log N, for example? Um, yeah, that's, um, that's, 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 that's weaker. Yeah. So if you, right. So for example, uh, right. Okay. So, for example, uh, okay. So, so here's one case of the Charlie conjecture. We don't know this. Yeah. It, impl it implies the logarithmic average version of the Charlie conjecture, which we do know to be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the, there's a submission by parts that, that lets you do this. Uh, yeah. So if you, you can average one more time, you wish. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, we, we also know that if you take, uh, say, n log n down okay. here, this is a little of log log x. Okay. Yes, but in, in a different direction. I want to divide n by log n. I want ah, to take. I want to yeah. go towards one. Yes, I think that that we also know to be true. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah. So we, we can prove something a bit stronger than this. Actually, that that if you. Um, some Mobius of n, Mobius n plus one over n, and then x over w or something. Uh, I think we can get uh, log w over root log log w or something. Um, there's, yeah. there's a bound like this. This is a very recent work of Helfgott and, and Radziwi. Um, and I think maybe this implies what you just said that if you stick yes, a log, I guess so because yeah. log is quite stable in the thing. Yeah. 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 Um, right. Yeah. So yeah, there are refinements of this which are recent. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you, Terry, mm -hmm. what is known about the patterns of Liouville function in general? So, for instance, do they grow? Uh, okay. Do they have? Uh, uh, complexity, which is grows uh, exponentially. Right. Okay. So uh, you can define S K to be the number of patterns that lambda n plus one lambda n plus k um, attain. Okay. So um, yeah. So the, the the number of sign patterns. Okay. Of uh, of k consecutive values of the Lua function. So um, conjecturally, um, so uh, S K should be true for k. Okay, so if, if the Charlie conjecture is true, then in fact, every sign pattern occurs equally often. Um, and so all two to the K different sign patterns should, should, uh, should occur. Um, currently, the best bound we have right now is that we know that it grows uh, um, um, greater than any power of A. For, for any A, um, um, it goes faster than, than any power of A. This was a result of um, Mandamaki, Ratsuri, Turbine, and my, Ziegler and myself uh, about a year or two ago. Um, yeah, that is the, uh, the the best we have. Um, the standard conjecture would certainly give us the full thing. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, but that, that, that is that is currently the state of the art. Yeah, so there's still, still a big gap. Okay, uh, so thank you very much, Terry. And uh, thanks again for giving uh, uh, the first uh, talk at our conference. 
Uh, thank you. Okay.